if you take Black's Ninth, has rendered an Anglo-Saxon rite to now a <clears throat> right of the judge to grant it. And if the judge grants it, <clears throat> that under Black's Ninth, they're saying that it is an unsworn statement. So they've really relegated... <clears throat> sorry, I've got a bit of frog in my throat. They've really relegated elocution now to almost a, meaning, a meaningless artefact. So before I jump in and say, here's a section, here it is, it's all done, I want to be absolutely clear in our research that we can prove to you the origin of it, uh, the provenance of it, when it is done, why it is done, and how it is done. Otherwise, I, I don't want to you know, be putting up false hope. So there's a lot there, and I covered a lot there in that answer, but I hope that gives some reason as to why we're not ready yet but a bit more as to what elocution appears to be in a historical sense and why it's still such an important element. Okay, just one okay. more question. Yeah, one just one yeah. more question. Back to the back to the the auctionarius, okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. when he makes the offer and I counter offer, um, yeah. they don't have to accept it, do they? No. No, but as a D Dutch auction, what you've done is effectively followed the auction process. Okay. They've put the highest bid, you put an underbid. They put a next higher bid, you put a next underbid. So right. think of it, it's, you've haggled for a price before. Right, right. That's all you're doing. You're haggling for a price. Right. If you don't offer a price, are you haggling? Yes or no? You're not, right. are you? So you've got to offer something meaningful, otherwise you're not haggling. I see. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for your questions, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for your questions. And um, I'm going to go to a couple of questions here that were on the chat earlier, Frank. Um, have you read the uh, book, The Curse of the Canaan, by Eustace Mullins? I have read a number of uh, Eustace Mullins' works. Um, I think okay. he was... Keep going. Yeah. They, they just wanted to know what your thoughts were uh, on that. And, uh, of course, if you read as many of his writings, that would be good input. Well, Eustace Mullins has, has written a number of works on this. Um, and, in fact, there's a growing number of works that um, that have come out. And I'm just looking at, a, at, a, at one in particular. I'm just looking at my, my book here. It's by a fellow by the name of... Uh, Shalomo Sand, that's S-H-L-O-M-O-S-A-N-D. It's called The Invention of the Jewish People. And he, this is a academic in Israel who basically has been <laughs> out of Israel, uh, where he shows that the, the evidence is overwhelming, is overwhelming that everything we think we know about the Jewish history, the Jewish tradition, is not only a fraud and a fiction, but uh, hides some terrible, terrible lies. And when you discuss this, of course, the first thing people say is that you're anti-Semitic. I mean, anti-Semitic means that you are uh, being biased on people, not based on their Jewishness, because the word Jewish uh, comes from the 16th century, but that uh, you are being biased. Semitic means you were born in the Palestinian Levant area of, uh, of the Middle East there and, and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. Well, when we speak of uh, the people that are in power at the moment, these people originate from southern Mongolia and uh, Kazakhstan, hence why they were called Khazars. They were never born in Palestine. They have no genetic connection to Palestine. They have no connection to the Levant. So... You can't be anti-Semitic talking about people who aren't Semitic. It's impossible. But that doesn't stop it. That's one of their kind of vomit reactions that they, they put there. My problem with Eustace Mullins is, is not his history, but his labels. We live in a society where the media has become a fine-tuned disinfo machine where they can summarize a man's life work in 15 seconds 
by putting a label on them. So just as uh, the word Zionist is a label, just as the word Khazar is a label, just as the word um, Parasite is a label, I can increasingly remain uh, concerned that uh, when you're dealing with labels, people can just as easily label you. So when we talk of uh, his work, what I think he failed to realize is all of this elaborate history, all this elaborate uh, ceremonies, all these elaborate lies, really at their heart are mind viruses. And so what we're dealing with is mind viruses and mentally ill people. It doesn't matter what you call them. You can call them Mongolians, you can call them Magyars, you can call them Khazars, you can call them Zionists, you can call them whatever you like. But we're really dealing with people who are severely mentally ill and that's the label that I ultimately want to focus on uh, so that's my summary of Eustace Mullins without getting into the detail of his book and the other books that I've read okay thank you Frank yes um, how do the Jesuits tie in with the uh, trilateral commission and possible other uh, worldwide entities international well, when you read the back end of uh, cognitive law, what you'll see is that the first system of mind influence, the matrix, was created by the Jesuits. The Jesuits are the intellectual elite. They were the inventors. They were the visitors. They were the auditors of the system up until a handful of families, most notably the banker families, decided that they'll run the show and that the Jesuits were part of an old system and were no longer required. So the Jesuits were put out to pasture after World War II. Um, they still play a very, very important part and make no bones about it. They still hold enormous influence. But they were sidelined by those that wrecked and destroyed their own system. You know, when you break a covenant as long as the Talmud, and the Talmud was created in 333, and it was a covenant with uh, uh, Baal Moloch, otherwise known as Sabaoth, uh, the most sacred day being the day of, Sab uh, of Sabaoth, uh, the legion, the host, the demon, the head of the demons. When you, when you break and breach that with Baal Moloch, otherwise known as Satan, uh, you're, really, uh, you, you're really thumbing your nose at the supernatural, and that's what these bankers did. And, and it's because they believed... Uh, about 60 years of uh, psychiatry that uh, there is no such thing as soul, that uh, religion is really a made-up belief system, and they feel comfortable in their dishonor of the supernatural, that uh, they could create themselves as gods, they could still have all the airs and graces of it all, uh, but they could ignore it. Now, the Jesuits are, are still... Uh, holding key key positions of authority in the system, and I I, I constantly get um, questioned whether I in fact am some kind of Jesuit this or Jesuit that because of background. I assure you, there is no organisation that is influenced. If there was, I wouldn't be talking about my financial position. It's because there has been no patronage, because there has been no financial support by any organisation. I am in the dire financial position I'm in. But the Jesuits play a crucial role in the organization of control in the system. The Federal Reserve, universities, uh, business, finance, they are everywhere. But they are playing at the moment uh, very much a double game because they have been dishonored, repeatedly dishonored by the ruling elite for the last 60, 70 years and they are seeing that system come to an end and the one thing the Jesuits are is that they are a stickler from big moments of history. When we talk about bankers, the bankers don't give two rats for history. Numbers to them are meaningless. They might build buildings with 666 windows, they might use symbols of Satanism, they might use all those things but do they believe them? No, they don't believe them at all. They, believe, they go to the ceremonies but to them, it's all about control. The Jesuits, however, actually have a deep abiding, certainly elite have, a deep abiding 
affinity to history and what they're doing and purpose. After all, uh, they are the architects of the whole system. So I, I, I covered a few things there. I hope that filled in some blanks about the Jesuits. Yes, thank you for, thank you for that, Frank. Um, I wanted to possibly know a little bit more about where the Rockefellers, Bushes, Clintons, and so forth fit in. Um, you covered that a little bit. And possibly uh, Masons or where they, they all fit in. Uh, they're the big, they're big questions. I think the best way for me to answer it is, before I can answer it, you need to get a bit of grounding on who's who in the zoo. So to that end, I would suggest to anyone that wants to know more about the dark side to go to a website called one-evil. That's O-N-E hyphen evil.org. If you go there, be prepared to be blown away, but you will see a lot of the background. And once you go there, then that will fill in a lot of those connections. And once you get that, then I think it's easy to talk. But there's such broad subjects. As I said before, the, the risk is throwing away a label on something and not really getting to the depth. If you want to understand the Masons and why they were created and who created them, you need to go and see some of that background. And I'm happy to talk about it in more detail in other talk shoes, but I, I don't think I can do justice to it in, in kind of one answer. All right? I, I agree, yeah. All right, uh, a couple questions real quick. Uh, Darwin had another question. What happens if you don't earn an income but have a tax or a business number? Well, the, 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 issue, the, the issue of tax ultimately is, is how you are connected into the system. Are you connected through your person as a taxpayer or are you connected through a company the taxpayer as opposed to a trust. That's the first. And the second then is, of course, being a taxpayer. So what I was trying to say tonight is that, you know, when people are looking for remedy in terms of tax and they've looked at all these different things, they're looking at statutes and they're looking at, uh, at uh, offsets and they're looking at credits and looking at all these different things, I just wanted to bring it back to the, to the essentials to say that the way that tax was set up and then corrupted, or not corrupted, but protected by treating the members of a society as effectively uh, enemies, aliens, was that a registered taxpayer is effectively admitting that you are a registered criminal when it comes to how the tax department can come down on you. So even if you don't have any tax to pay, even if you haven't earned an income, if you are registered, it means that you're giving them the right next year, the year after, until you die to hound you. And that's what the tax departments do. They hound people, in some cases, to death. Well, especially if you're not acquire something of value. Uh, so you didn't have something at first, and then you acquire something. Uh, so then you get hounded and hounded. So uh, very good. Thank you, Frank. Um, question from uh, chat here. What are your thoughts regarding the east-west movement of civilization from Ireland westward rather than the reverse? Well, I, I think um, one of the one of the there are orthodoxies in in sociology, anthropology, and, and history that talk about how civilization emerged from the hunter-gatherer, the nomadic uh, tribes that would um, hunt at night, that would hide during the day, and that were the kind of first organized groupings of, of um, men and women. And the logic is that uh, it was the great river delta cultures of, of uh, Asia uh, and uh, Mesopotamia that we saw the emergence of civilization. So the Sahara is completely ignored, which 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 should be for anyone the grounds of um, the grounds of disputing this in the first place, because the Sahara was uh, and 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 North Africa was for thousands of years the food bowl. The Roman Empire got 90% of its grain from North Africa. I mean, North Africa was fertile, fertile from sea to sea, from ocean to ocean. 
And it was only 